kill a body. I got a job. I'm more grass. And they say I do a good job. I live on my own, and I like it very much. Garth loves to be loved. He is a child of love, and he gives the most unconditional love. Alexa has a ton of proud moments. Alexa is a really great kid. He gives us love back, and he shows us a different way to view the world. He was meant to be just who he is in this lifetime. He's a real hero. What we are about to share is a true and compelling story about ever-increasing human understanding and how that understanding has slowly reshaped the way we as a society respond to, interact with, and support persons with mental retardation. The people and events depicted in this documentary are real, as are their emotions that at times cry out from the screen. Please note that third-person narration is prevalent not because of its artistic merit, but because the actual words and thoughts of people with mental retardation were never recorded until recent years. As such, this account will join the very earliest recordings of people who up until now have had no voice. With a voice comes understanding. to appreciate history. And I just want to remind you that you too have a history. And it's important that you remember who started things, what went on in your own state. Keep mindful of the people who pioneered because someday you also will be pioneers and will be recommended for what has been accomplished. There are many reasons to study our history. It opens windows that shed light on who we are today. One particular unforgiving window illuminates society's historic response to people with disabilities and mental retardation. Over the last 100 years and more, societal moods have swung from spiritually cradling people with disabilities as holy innocents to exploiting them for cost-efficient labor to recognizing them as fully sentient human beings entitled to basic civil rights. Until recent years, no matter which school of thought was in vogue, it usually flourished in isolation, each an emotional and physical biosphere. As this saga continues to unfold within our institutions and communities today, there is history that demands to be chronicled. To that end, this work documents how an entire strata of society found its voice after untold centuries of silence. It will underscore how very far we have come and, most importantly, remind us that the coming is never over. And so my belief became even deeper than a belief. It became a knowing that David had the capacity to learn, to grow, to become. And he's literally become my merchant of hope. If I had the ultimate power, I would change the way people look at my son. And I would want them to know that he has as much right to everything and anything in life that you or I are entitled to. Because his disability doesn't make him any different. He needs what you and I need. He needs love, he needs support, he needs family, he needs friends, he needs school, he needs education. It has to all be put into his perspective what he's still deserving of that. He doesn't need to live away from us or be segregated from us or learn any differently from us. He just needs to learn what we need to learn in order to survive to have a fabulous life. Throughout history, segregation has invariably been at the heart of treatment for people with disabilities. As society entrenched itself in one trend after another, 
People with disabilities were hidden from mainstream society so as not to violate the comfort zone of civilized Americans. In the 19th century, families were encouraged to segregate their relatives with mental retardation. The thinking of the day was that people with mental retardation were less than human, that they didn't have emotions and feelings like the rest of us. So it wasn't uncommon to find situations that were deplorable, where people were chained to chairs in basements, in attics, in cellars, without food, without appropriate clothing, without blankets. Um, it was told to families that they didn't know the difference anyway, and that there was little that they could do for them anyway. In 1818, the first residential facility was built in Connecticut to, quote, house and instruct idiot children. The Asylum for the Deaf and Dumb made an effort to develop and educate its residents. But this was an exception. Most early 19th century solutions relied upon the almshouses as well as mental hospitals. People who lived with their families had a chance for a good life. Others were treated under the poor laws which were written and intended to deter, to make poverty unpalatable, to make relief come bitter and dear. Typical of early 19th century apathy, people with disabilities were commonly sold to low bidders who would care for them for the least amount of public support. Unfortunately, this callous mentality resurfaces many times throughout our history. What was prevalent in the 19th century, this notion of caring for people as cheaply as possible, continues as we trace the history of the field of supporting people with mental retardation. As late as 30 years ago, we look at instances of people being cared for for roughly half of what it costs to care for an animal in the zoo. Even today, costs are a salient consideration as we ponder public policy into the next century. As we approach the mid-19th century, a marked turn in human services was pioneered by reformists, such as Dorothea Dix and Samuel Gridley Howe. Fueled by what they perceived to be indifference at best and legalized barbarity at worst, both were early proponents of what they considered humane, state-sponsored institutionalization. In this period of great optimism, training and education were their goals quite a departure from the cold, harsh standards that had persisted for so long. Darthea Lynn Dix was a pioneer in mental health. She came to Pennsylvania in 1845 and visited all the almshouses, poorhouses, jails, and prisons. There she found that the mentally ill were incarcerated as if they were common criminals. They were chained to the walls, they were given very little to eat, and actually left to die there. One time she asked for a blanket for one of the female prisoners and the warden said, she doesn't need a blanket. She has no feeling. That was the attitude toward these, toward these poor human beings. She went before the legislature with what she had seen, and they were so impressed that they appropriated money for the first public mental health institution in Pennsylvania. It was called the Pennsylvania State Lunatic Hospital and Union Asylum, and housed people with all kinds of disorders. These brave reformers persuaded their legislatures that the state, as opposed to local jurisdictions, should have direct responsibility for establishing and operating mental hospitals. Dick strongly advocated that these mental hospitals also serve people with epilepsy and mental retardation. The feeble-minded needed protection from society as they invariably attracted the attention of those who would consider them easy prey. In 1852, a private residential facility was established in Germantown, Pennsylvania. In a few years, this facility was relocated to media, becoming the Pennsylvania Training School for Feeble-Minded Children. Today, it is known as the Elwin Institute. By the 1880s, the winds of change were again redirecting public opinion as well as funding. People with mental retardation who were formerly considered innocent and deserving of benevolent protection had now become social parasites in the eyes of society. Paranoia about the impure blood of imbeciles passing through our floodgates and poisoning our great country was rampant. Indeed, alarmists trumpeted warnings about the U.S. becoming the dumping ground of all nations. 
this fear and prejudice about people with mental retardation was reflected in immigration policy. People with mental retardation, like gays and like people with other disabilities, were considered immigration risks. And if they were let into the country, they were often prohibited from marrying or having children. This same fear and ignorance continued to proliferate as we opened institutions that were created to support people with mental retardation. Ironically, the communal responsibility that Dorothea Dix and Samuel Gridley Howe urged did indeed result in the creation of institutions. But over time, the tenor and mission of these institutions changed. There were always periods of very humane care in families, in the community, and eventually, for one reason or another, things would change in the community, and these people eventually became ostracized, became isolated, and what was humane care in the home and in the community rapidly deteriorated into very in inhumane care in communities. So that institutions sprung up, institutions of care that were usually under religious auspices of one kind or another. And they, too, provided very excellent care in the beginning. But after a period of years, again, abuses started to develop, support was lacking, and the same tragedies then started to occur in institutions that led to the kind of scandals that we saw in our mental hospitals. In 1897, Pennsylvania opened the State Institution for the Feeble-Minded of Western Pennsylvania in Venango County about 70 miles north of Pittsburgh. Originally conceived as a training school to assist children unable to keep pace in a public setting, this institution became the Polk Center. A self-sufficient entity, Polk depended largely on an agrarian economy to support the institution and its thousands of inhabitants. As construction of the 800-acre compound was completed, Polk's original emphasis on healthy farm work, woodworking, sewing and rug making gave way to custodial care, as was the trend nationally. Although conditions and attitudes emerged at this time that would not meet with our present day sensibilities, it is important to note that these attitudes reflected society's current level of understanding. I remember in a facility in New York where I went to do some training, and there was a lady there who was 104 years of age, and she went there when she was five. And you think of institutionalization, and you think of where we were, how we were housed persons during those years, and you think of the kind of treatment that had, and these are good people who thought they were doing good. They were providing excellent treatment. Excellent treatment to them was keeping them dry, keeping them fed, and keeping them safe. The human services field doesn't generally start trends we're not trendsetters. We follow what society dictates as the appropriate means and the appropriate way. A hundred years ago, unless you were a very wealthy person, there were no services available for the general public who had a son, a daughter, a brother, or sister with developmental disabilities. Leading experts of the day believed prolonged institutionalization and desexualization to be the best form of prevention. We propose to keep those whom we cannot cure and equip for life in custody until they are past the reproducing age and stamp out hereditary imbecility and epilepsy right here and now. This fear of reproduction lasted well into the 20th century. David Miller, recreational director and assistant superintendent at Pennhurst State School and Hospital from 1957 to 1971, provides a first-hand account. Well, obviously, it was clear that if men and women got even close to each other, they would have sex and, and they, would, they would procreate. And this was the major fear of the, of the institution and, and society in general. When I got here, uh, we were still involved with the male cottages down here and up on the hill, the female colony and never the twain should meet. They weren't supposed to meet, and they really didn't for, 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 for a great deal of the time. With many schools following the colony plan with its self-sustaining, cost-efficient management ethic, justification was simple. Using the labor of this class would command absolutely nothing if brought into competition with even the most unskilled labor of persons of normal mind. 
Hence, residents were used for everything from institutional laundry to dry scrubbing floors, sometimes with no purpose except mindless diversion. This is a floor block, also known as a dry scrubber. It was used for two reasons. It was used to wax the floor. A cloth would be put on the block and wax would be on the floor. And it would also be used as a tranquilizer to tire out the patients. Patients who were acting out would be made to use the floor block. It would tire them out extensively and help them sleep better at night. And I learned to work at, at, at a young age. I started, we had dry scrubs here and I, every summer I went into the can and reek to help. The dry scrubs are like blocks with a handle to it. And one of the things that struck me when I first got here was that I would see people who are doing work, full-time work, like a, a guy who was working in the powerhouse shoveling coal. And he would be introduced to me as one of our working boys. And this man was not a boy, this was a man, and, and he was viewed as a boy, and, and I think the, the concept of eternal child was one of the ones that, that came across uh, almost completely when, when I first came here. My first day here, uh, as an introduction, I was taken through the, quotes female colony by a doctor who had been here for many years. And as we walked through this large, area with perhaps 105, 110 uh, women, all terribly dressed in sort of half in gowns, not all of them clothed properly. And as they came eagerly up to, to, to us, as we walked through, the doctor said, don't let them touch you. And that was sort of a very, very difficult thing for me to deal with. By 1900, scientists were convinced that feeble-mindedness was hereditary and required total segregation from the rest of society. Calling themselves progressives, these activists were given to eugenic arguments of the time, eager to confine people with disabilities for life and halt all propagation. Individual spirits and individual lives were given little credence. Few persons with disabilities had the audacity to voice personal wishes or opinions, and history has shown that even fewer were listening. Pinhurst was built in 1913, and it's important to, to point out that that was at the height of the eugenist uh, hysteria of, of the years around the turn of the century. And this was the same era that saw the passage of the Jim Crow legislation in the South, the hysteria about immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe, the whole fear among uh, Northern um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, Northern Europeans, that uh, people of inferior races were contaminating the gene pool. With marriage laws unenforceable, forced sterilization hit its peak with paranoia fostering its legalization in 23 states. It was in this political climate that Laurelton Center opened in the 1920s as a, quote, home for feeble-minded women of childbearing age. With priority given to those whose families could not afford proper care at home, thousands of people with mental retardation were ushered into institutional life during the 1920s and 30s. Whereas the institutions of Dix's vision in the 1800s were dedicated to creating a home-like environment, this noble intent was later abandoned in the interest of economy and ease of resident management. Really, the consideration was how cheap could you do it for? And I know that Penhurst was noted for doing its entire program for $6 a day at that time, which doesn't mean an awful lot now. Uh, that was, and, and the goal was to get that, that number down. That was one of the political goals. The situation was horrible. The situation was, was untenable in terms of the number of people, in terms of the crowding, in terms of the the, the uh, condition, the maintenance, uh, and, and all of those things. And the staff were doing the best they could with what they had. Of course, what they really had was an army of people who shouldn't have been here to begin with who were being exploited and who were doing all of the work of the, of the institution. Now, the ideal size of an institution was determined to be 1,000 to 3,000 people. And overcrowding became rampant 
even by the lax standards of the day. During the Depression, each physical plant's resources became strained as thousands awaited admission to institutions that were already stretched beyond recommended limits. Dormitories accommodated dozens upon dozens of residents. Cribs were crammed end to end, and inhabitants were left in dehumanizing physical conditions, which rapidly became the outstanding characteristic of institutional life. Pat Haleko entered a state institution at the age of 10. Her first-hand experiences reveal the traumas associated with institutionalization at this time. The death pay was awful. The tenants just knocked them around. They used to pull their hair at us. People got sick and they didn't care. No way did they care. And the nurse didn't give it on. And she said, Oh, they're not sick. A lot of people died there. I am so glad I'm out of there. They ought to be torn down. Yet some residents share quite a different experience. It was all right. The insides of the buildings were nice. The outside of the buildings were nice. The grounds were nice which they ain't no more. I hated to leave, but they had to throw me out, so I went out. Well, it was a nice place. Wasn't nothing wrong about it. We got everything we needed. And when I grew up, I run all over the place. I rode a bicycle, and I run here, run there, went for a long walk, you'd pick up it. I used to climb trees, pick apples out of the tree and everything, and all that stuff. And I used to write all different kinds of stuff. It was wonderful. I loved it when I was a kid. You know, I wish I was a kid all over again. How about that right out? It was all right with me because I used to go to Glee Club. I used to sing in the church choir, and I used to go out to a lot of churches to sing and everything. Boy, we had really a ball we did. By the end of the 1930s, persons with mental retardation were viewed in a new and more positive light. Professionals were re-examining both their assumptions and their tools, and universities began to acknowledge the exceptional child. However, in 1939, Nazi Germany, with all its sweeping legacy, tragically demonstrated the fragility of humanitarianism. Initially, Germany's disabled and all other, quote, miscreants and degenerates were merely starved to death in mental institutions. When that was deemed inefficient, Hitler's machine took to gassing thousands from occupied countries all over Europe. Ironically, the tragedy in Europe served to accelerate greater recognition and more humane treatment here at home. Although institutions continued to be built, the focus at this time inched toward the development of community services. Persons participating in the 1940 White House Conference on Children in a Democracy noted critical failures in current programming for persons with mental retardation. The report emphasized the need for community services, concluding that, quote, appropriate education and suitable employment in the community are frequently the best treatment for persons with such limitations. Clinics, Sheltered workshops such as Goodwill Industries and schools were established. But there remained conspicuous gaps in service. Lack of broad-based public support and trained personnel impeded the growth of such programs. June James, a Polk resident, tells us her story. Well, what could I do? I can't go out the street and live, so that's why they brought me to Polk. They wouldn't take me to grade school in Pittsburgh. Kind of the kids would carry on and cry and that. They didn't want me to be in their class. And the one teacher said, that's not the way to do it. Well, they're scared of her. Well, why would that? The girl, that's the way the Lord made her. She didn't do it herself. 
and my dad, my father said that's the way she came when she was coming to my mother. And a lot of people said they don't believe it. And she and my dad said, you don't have to believe it. You watch what you and dad, you'll know. And they watched what I did. They said, oh my gosh, that's a miracle. I thought she couldn't do nothing. The federal government assumed a leadership role during the 40s and 50s with progressive legislation. In 1946, Congress established the National Institute of Mental Health, which devoted funds to both training and research in mental retardation. 1958 saw the first categorical piece of legislation specifically devoted to mental retardation, authorizing federal funds to universities for the training of specialized personnel. In 1949, the Pennsylvania Association for Retarded Children was founded. Parents were becoming more vocal and less willing to hear that nothing could be done for their children. Thus came the birth of a whole new generation of family advocates on behalf of persons with mental retardation. In 1948, a woman in Philadelphia wrote to the local newspaper and asked if there were other parents who had children with retardation and who had nothing for them and would like to meet her in her home to talk about their problems. Eight people came, and out of that eight people grew an association for retarded children. It was called then, later became Association for Retarded Citizens. Remember, that was in the early 1950s, before we had the right to education for all handicapped children, which I'm proud to say the ARC of Pennsylvania was instrumental in bringing about. We had, um, we had to uh, try and make the general public understand that children with retardation were more like other children than different, that they had the same kinds of desires, that they laughed, that they played, that they cried, that they had pain, and that they could be naughty, and that they could learn too. Gradually, what started with eight desperate parents trying to find something for their children grew into an association for retarded children. It became strong. We worked hard. Parents were able to accomplish things for their children, but not all that was needed. And became, we, we came to learn that all of the things we'd wanted to do, had always wanted to do and worked hard for, couldn't be done by being nice. And we realized that we could no longer be a pleading hand we had to be a clenched fist, and today we are forced to be reckoned with. The most significant thing, I think, is the right to education. That opened the door for a lot of youngsters. Are you talking about students that are in special education? They've been able to, for the first time, they are thinking of themselves as part of the school. Leah was born in 1966, and uh, she went to grade school, and then she went to the junior high school, and she went to senior high school, and she went to the Rotec program, and she was the first person with Down syndrome to move through all of these programs and very successfully. And the highlight of her life